Last week, uh, our friend Katie D kicked off our new series called Formed by the Spirit. And so for the next about six weeks, we're going to be um, just camped in, in this section of the gospel according to John, John 14 through uh, 17. And so it's called Formed by the Spirit. And if you guys have been around Remembrance Community Church, you probably note that that's a key part of what we call our vision statement, right? Our vision statement is simply, we want to be a type of church that is becoming a community that is being transformed by the Spirit, formed by the Spirit, to become more like Jesus, to live more like Jesus. And when we live more like Jesus, we believe that's the best way to display God's goodness um, on this planet, everywhere we go. And so we believe that the best disciple-forming uh, strategy is kind of what we've adopted as what we call the, the triangle of transformation. And so three points on a triangle, and then there's a center part. Oh, cool. So we'll get you there. That's it. See, I just said it, you guys. I wasn't lying. Nailed it. And now we got this triangle of transformation. Awesome. And so the, the three triangles represent, we, we, we believe that exposing uh, ourselves and each other to God's truth is transformative, amen? And that we need to do this in community as a church, being around each other, investing in the types of relationships and spending time um, in God's word together in community, and that there are certain practices that we reorient our lives around if we want to follow Jesus and those practices God uses those to transform us. But all of this must be energized, or all of the, this must be, be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit you see in the middle of the triangle. And so we try to kind of form our discipleship um, process around this. And so this whole year, you might have noticed that we've just been following this, this kind of triangle rhythm with our teaching. We did a, a, a whole section, a whole quarter on, on the truth on God's truth, just really digging in. And then we did one on community. And then we just finished one on practices, radical orthopraxy. And so now, here at the end of this this year, we're we're honing in on how do we see the Holy Spirit working in us and through us? And that's a major part of what this John 14 and 16 is all about. Uh, Theologians call this section um, the farewell discourse. And then John 17 is called the high priestly prayer. And so basically what's happening is, um, what John is presenting to us is, most of you know that on the night before Jesus was crucified, he had a last supper, a final meal, a Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. And this conversation that we're going to be studying is happening at that meal. So the, the farewell discourse is Jesus' last meal with his disciples, and he's really just talking about some really heartfelt, deep, meaningful, most important things. And so it's really important. And a big chunk of it is about how the Holy Spirit is going to come and continue to work in and through the church in order for us to accomplish the types of lies that Jesus died for and rose that we could live. And so the farewell discourse. And there's a ton here about how God intends to transform his people, right? To live more like Jesus and display the goodness of God. Or how John would say it is to live for the glory of God, which is to display the goodness of God, that people can see God through what he's doing in our lives and through our lives. That's kind of the the, the idea. And so I want to invite you to stand as we read God's word this morning, and we're particularly going to be just camping in a few verses in John 14, uh, in verse 12 through 19. And some of these uh, KDD um, uh, pointed out, but I want to dig a little deeper into, and just really, just really marinate on this, this passage, which as you'll see, I'm going to call a theological sandwich. Let's read. It says, Truly I tell you, The one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he or she will do even greater works than these. Because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. 
so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. And so we call this a theological sandwich, and you may be seated. And I call it a theological sandwich because in many ways, the way John is constructing this verse 12 through 19 is that there's this really cool slice of bread, and then there's the meat, and then there's another really cool slice of bread. And so the, the, the meat of this passage, the meat of this passage, which I would say might be the meat of the whole New Testament, and the whole purpose, really, of what does it mean to be a Christian, and it's this. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Jesus is saying to his people, if you love me, then you will keep my commands. Now this word love that, that John is using here is the word agape. Many of you guys have heard of it. And so agape, sometimes it's known as the Christian love, right? Not to be mistaken with the Christian chicken, because that's Chick-fil-A, right? <laughs> agape is the Christian love, and we have all these different, it's a, it's a Greek word that's really hard to translate, to be honest with you. Um, Christian love is, is maybe as good as, as, as any, but particularly the way that Jesus is using it here, it has to do with if, you, if you're passionate about me, if you're passionate about following me, then you'll follow me, then you'll obey my commands. And maybe this might remind you of our last series, Radical Orthopraxy, which we were defining as what? Seeing the surpassing worth of following Jesus and then reorienting our lives around that conviction, which is exactly what Jesus is saying here, right? If you see the surpassing worth of following me, if you, if you want to passionately follow me, well, then you're going to need to follow me, right? It almost makes too, too much sense, right? It's like, it's like, yeah, no duh, right? If you're going to follow someone, then you've got to follow them, right? And that's what he's saying is, is, is but are you? Because it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be all kinds of discouragement, distractions. And so it's one thing to say, like, I'm, I'm committed to following Jesus. It's another thing to walk that out day after day, and to grow more and more to be like Jesus. But that is exactly what Jesus is saying. His last meal, think about that. His last meal, final words, final discourse, farewell discourse. He's like, guys, remember a couple years ago I said, follow me. You didn't know what you were getting into, but you saw something and you said, okay, I'll follow you. Now you've been following me for a while. You know you know how exciting it could be. You know how hard it could be. And I'm just telling you, if you love me, keep going. Obey my commands. If anyone sees the surpassing worth of following Jesus, then they'll reorient their lives. They'll commit to reorienting, reorienting their lives around this conviction. I don't think we could ever talk about this enough. This is kind of the heart of Christianity. That's why I call it the meat of this sandwich. This is a really important passage in the New Testament, right? And the meat of it is just this simple call that we talk about all the time, because we should talk about it all the time. Are we passionate Jesus followers? Are we passionately following Jesus? And the thing is, the world, Jesus knows this, and we need to know this. And I think we do know this. 
The world needs to see passionate Jesus followers in order to see why they should be passionate about following Jesus. Does that make sense? The world needs to see people who are see the surpassing worth of Jesus, of following Jesus, and they're watching them in real time reorient their lives, do what they do, not do what they refrain from doing because they love Jesus. The world needs to see that if they're going to see the goodness of God. If they're going to see Jesus, they're going to need to see that. In a little while, I'm going to leave, he ends that. And then people won't be able to see me, but you'll be able to see me. And they will be able to see me through you. See what he's saying? So this is a really important piece of meat. (laughs) It's the big idea to passionately follow Jesus And the the, the pathway of following Jesus and the end goal of following Jesus, I think Dallas Willard just makes it as simple as I think it can be made. He says, the idea is that we slow down and be with Jesus. And here's where the triangle of transformation becomes so helpful. Like, what does that look like to slow down and be with Jesus? Well, we'll, we'll invest yourself in, in, in saturating yourself in God's truths. Like, study God's Word. Be around people who are talking about it. Talk about it with each other. Pursue conversations. Listen to podcasts. Listen to the type of music that's, 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 that's saturated in God's truth. And then invest in community, godly community. Be here on Sundays. If you can, get in a community group. We, we, we provide a bunch of stuff for you to do, not just because we think you don't have enough stuff to do, but we want to give you opportunity to be together because that's how God is shaping us. That's what it looks like to slow down and be with Jesus and, and Jesus' people. And then he says, and when you do this, you'll slowly over time become more and more like Jesus. And the end goal is that our, we would be so saturated and filled with the Holy Spirit and, and transformed by the Spirit to live like Jesus, that we would be living like Jesus, which Dallas Willard says, I want to live the type of life that Jesus would live if he walked in my shoes. And man, doesn't the world need to see people living this way? And that's the meat of this passage. And arguably, it's the meat of the New Testament. But let's notice what comes before it. A couple things. What comes before it and what comes after. If you have a piece of meat, it's not a sandwich until you, put, you slap a piece of bread on both sides, right? And John does exactly that. And so in verse 12, the first piece of bread he layers this with is he says, the one who believes in me, Jesus is saying this, will also do the works that I do. So if if we believe in Jesus, then we'll, we'll continue to do what we saw him doing, what he modeled for us, what he taught us to do. And then he says this really profound thing, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And, and he, the one who believes in me, will do even greater works than these. And then he has this meat. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. And then he goes, hey, Jesus is going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another counselor or helper, or the word is paraclete, which we'll talk about. And so this is a wonderful theological sandwich. The one who believes in me, he says, will do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these. First, let's try to wrap our, 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 our brains around this, this idea. What does it mean that we will do greater works than Jesus was doing? Have any of you guys ever seen this passage and wondered what it means? Have any of you guys ever heard like ideas, people give you interpretation, what does this mean? What have you guys heard? Let's, let's see a little group chat. What have you guys heard? What do you think this means? We're going to do greater things than Jesus was doing. And this is coming from Jesus. Jesus is saying this, right? So it must mean something. 
What does it mean? Maybe farther reaching when Jesus had his ministry, it was in a general, you know, close location. Okay, so geographically, we're, re- we're reaching this little region here, and man, you're going to reach the whole world, right? Yeah, okay, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Some people interpret it like, oh, maybe we'll do greater miracles than Jesus did, right? Any others? Well, these are, these are, you guys are doing great. There's three that I've heard. There's three interpretations that I've heard. And the first one, Marco brought up. It's the idea that we will, we, we will, we will do greater things, and, and, and by this, we're thinking of the wow factor, we're going, to do, we're going to be able to do greater things than Jesus. Now, I, I know Marco, so I know he probably doesn't hold, hold to that. And so I don't, I, don't, I don't feel bad about saying, this is probably the weakest interpretation. <laughs> right? Because Jesus did some pretty amazing things. I mean, that would be a pretty profound statement. Like, you're going to do greater things than Jesus, right? Jesus did some pretty... And the church has done some great things. Like, I, I believe in some healing and prophetic things. and there, Like, miracles happen through the church. But I don't know that many of us would, would say that we've ever walked on water. Like, what would it look to, to do greater things than walk on water? Like, what would be greater than that? I, I don't know. I can't even think of an, an example, right? What about feeding the 5,000 with... with with, with five pieces of fish and five loaves of bread, right? And that's just the 5,000 men. So we think that's probably like 15,000 people with women and children. Jesus fed with a, a five pieces of fish and five uh, a bread that was intended to feed a little kid for lunch, right? What would that look like to do greater things? Are we going to do less? Like, well, oh, what about this? The church could do two and a half pieces of fish and two, and we'll feed 30,000, right? Or how many of us have ever predicted that we would die and rise from the dead and then it came to fruition? Like, we're probably not going to do greater wow factor things than Jesus. That's not probably what he means. And in John 5, he's already said, uh, he said, the Father loves Jesus and he shows him everything that he's doing and he will show him greater works than these so that you will be amazed. We were already amazed by Jesus. People were amazed by Jesus. People don't need the church to do greater things than Jesus did and be more amazed than they were about Jesus. That's not a need. We already have Jesus who did those things. The other thing might be uh, the idea that Jesus is inviting us, the church, to do greater things in volume, meaning Jesus built a church that we could say, we could estimate was around 120-ish. And, and, and since then, the church has gone on to plant many churches that are bigger than that and themselves. And he's reached many, many people, right? The church is going to, the, the ministry that, Jesus, that they saw Jesus do, the works that Jesus was doing in volume, the church is going to go on and it's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to surpass that exponentially. Maybe that's what he's saying. I think that's a good interpretation. And maybe some people say that he's, we're going to do greater things in, in, in what we would call like in timing, meaning. When Jesus was doing all the things in his earthly ministry, he was still predicting the work that he was going to do on the cross. He was, he was foretelling it. But once Jesus did that and rose from the dead and ascended. And now we live in a time where that's been done. It's been finished. And so maybe the greater works are that we actually live in the time when, when it's our job to, to practice the way of Jesus and practice and promote the work of Jesus. And so I don't have a definitive answer. Those, those are just some of the common interpretations. But I think I think it probably has something to do with this idea that, that, that when Jesus is not done, like the, the, the greatest works had not yet been done. Jesus lived on this earth and he began something that's going to grow and do even more in, in total volume than even had already happened. And you see that in context because he's like, I'm at the end of this. 
season where I'm here on earth with you before I die. And I'm going to be with the Father. But the idea is he's encouraging them that the best is yet to come. More is still to happen. Even greater work, even greater impact is going to happen now that I'm leaving. Now that I'm, a com- I'm dying, I'm rising, and I'm leaving. And that interesting and important interpretive kind of conversation, though, aside, what does it mean that we're going to do greater works? Let's look at three other profound things in this little section that I think we often miss because of that big statement. Three things that we see here in the first slice of bread is that all believers are called into the ministry of Jesus. All believers. Look at what it says in verse 12. Truly I tell you, the one who believes, everyone that believes, every believer, all believers, the one who believes in me, all believers, will also do the works that I do. If you're wondering what God wants to do in and through your life, one of the chief things He wants to do is He wants to live through you, and he wants you to do the works that he was doing. He wants you to live a Jesus ministry type life. He wants us to do that. It's for all believers. It doesn't say, hey, some guy on TV that you can send a bunch of money to is going to do greater things than Jesus and perform these wild miracles that you're all going to be wowed by. No, it says, no, not that televangelist, you all of you, you're going to do greater things. You're going to do greater works than you saw Jesus doing in his ministry. And the second is that we do what we do in the name of Jesus. He says, what you ask in my name, I will do. In Jesus' name. So often, I do things in my own name, right? Right? I do it selfishly. I do it for me. I do it because I want to be recognized or I want to be more comfortable or I want to be more rich or I want to be more happy or I want to be like, I do most of the things I do in my name. He's like, what if you surrendered that and you started living for Jesus' name? And he adds to that, and to do what we do for the glory of God. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in Jesus the Son. And so ultimately, the transforming work of the Spirit is happening in us and through us. And the telos, the end goal of that, is that it would point people to Jesus. Because he's like, I'm going to, I've been with you, and, but I'm going to leave, and the world is not going to be able to see me, but you will be able to see me because I live, you will live, and now the people are going to need to see Jesus through us. That's kind of the point. So the meat of the verse, if you agape Jesus, if you're passionately, if you see the surpassing worth of following Jesus, then begin to reorient your lives and live, do the works that he was doing. Live your life, model your life around what you see, how you see Jesus being the model for how we should live. What would Jesus do, right? It's the cheesy uh, 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 wristband that we all wore like in the 90s, right? What would Jesus do? But it's actually a good way to live. And then he caps off this theological sandwich with a really important like capstone piece. If you imagine like the little bun and then on the top like the big sesame seed bun, that's what we got last. If we see the surpassing worth of following Jesus and, and our job is to live more like Jesus, how many you think that's an easy task? How many of you think that's a task you can do on your own? In fact, it is not a task that anyone is expecting you to do on your own. I'm sorry, I'm trying to turn it off. 
Hey, I believe in AI prophecy. I love it. I love it. AI is in the building. If we've seen the surpassing worth of following Jesus, and, we, and we've decided that we're going to reorient our lives around that conviction, we're going to need help. And that help must come from the Holy Spirit. And so G- Jesus goes like this. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor, or helper, or paraclete, to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. And so this word parakletos, or paraclete, is John, the, 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 the writer John, is the only one of all the New Testament writers who use this term, parakletos. And it's interesting. He uses this term four times in this section, the farewell uh, discourse, four times, parakletos. And every one of those four times, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. And then he uses it one other time in one of his other letters, 1 John. And, and that context, it's actually referring to Jesus. So the parakletos is not unique to the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the parakletos is the Holy Spirit here in John, but it's also, it's also Jesus. And what it means, it can be translated, it's hard to translate. It's a Greek word that's hard to translate. Sometimes it's helper in, in our CSB, it's counselor, comforter. Those are all advocate. Those are all fine because this is a hard word. But really it means someone who is called to one side as a source of help. Have you ever been in over your head and then somebody showed up that was like able to help you and then you were like, Oh, good, that person's here, right? That's a parakletos. Have you ever been going through something and want, it's not, like you can't do this on your own, but you have a team and you're just so glad that your team is there to support you and to encourage you and to just be with you? That's parakletos. You can't do it on your own. And the parakletos is there to help you get through it. That's what this word means. Sometimes, sometimes this might be uh, somebody who speaks on behalf of a person who is in need. And you think about that as Jesus is saying, I want you to continue to do the type of work that you saw me doing. And you're going to actually, in that, accomplish even more, more. And I think in volume is probably the best way of doing that. You're going you're to keep doing this and more ministry is still to come. Even more than we've already done so far, Right? And so one of those is maybe someone who speaks on behalf of a person in need. And you think of Jesus with that one woman who was caught in adultery. And the Pharisees wanted to throw rocks at her till she was dead. And they said, Jesus, she's been caught in adultery. The law says we should do this. What do you say? And what did Jesus do? Jesus spoke on behalf of a person who was in need. He stood up for her. He had her back. When she was being exploited to try to trap Jesus, Jesus was like, nah, no, I'm not allowing that to happen right now. And he's brilliant, so he goes, hey, any of you who hasn't, hasn't sinned, you throw the first stone. And they all bailed, right? He pointed out like, hey, we're all sinners here. It could also be Someone who intercedes in a conflicted situation. Parakletos. Somebody who might intercede in a conflicted situation. Think of all the times when Jesus' disciples, who are supposed to be the good guys who get it, they were all fighting with each other. Right? And Jesus would enter in, like in Mark 10, and go, you guys are arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Let me just school you a second. Like, the one who serves the most is the greatest, right? And he goes, the world, they lead and they think of greatness as like, you know, authoritarian and power. He said, but don't, don't let it be true with you. You guys lay down your life for, other, for each other, right? You guys have each other's backs. He intercedes in a conflicted situation. Another way that this might be used is it encourages 
the dispirited or consoles the grieving. Too many to think about where Jesus does that, right? Where he encourages the dispirited and consoles the grieving. Those who were sick, when he went and healed them, he wasn't just doing miracles so that everybody would go, wow. He was comforting those who were hurting, who were in despair, who were dispirited. And this is the kind of works that we see Jesus doing. Amen? Amen. And so this is the kind of work that the church is called to. And he goes like this. You'll ask the Father and he will give you another parakletos. So right here Jesus is, is saying what John is saying. Like you already have a parakletos. Me. Jesus. But God, he's going to send you another one. The Holy Spirit. As a basic overview, you might say it like this. The Father will send the Spirit in Jesus' name, and Jesus will send the Spirit from the Father because they're going to need help. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive Him because it does not see Him or know Him. But you do know Him because He remains with you, and He will be in you. So the key idea is that the Spirit is going to keep doing the work that Jesus was doing, and now He's going to do it through the church. So the work continues through the church, in us and through us. And note the Spirit does not replace Jesus, does it? And nor can we replace Jesus. The church's job is not to replace Jesus, It's to be the hands and feet of Jesus so that the world can see the love of Jesus and fall in love with Him. What the world needs is the Holy Spirit filling the church so that we can live like Jesus, so that we can display the goodness of God everywhere we go. And there's one little section here that I want to deal with before we kind of wrap it up. He goes like this. Well, first of all, he goes a couple things. In John 14, 16, before we get to the wrap it up one. He says three things about the Spirit. He goes, the Spirit is going to be with you. And then in 17, it says he's going to remain with you. Now, in Greek, these are different terms. And they have different meanings. When he says in 16, he's going to be with you, the Greek is kind of like a, a, a quality type of be with you. Like, you ever, you ever heard the difference between let's spend quality time together versus quantity time? This would be quality time. The Spirit is already spending quality time with you. And then in verse 7 he goes, and he's going to remain with you. He's also going to spend quantity time with you. This would be the word that we would use, minos. It means abide. This is often translated as abide. He's going to abide with you. And then in verse 17 he says, and he's going to be in you. <laughs> Can the parakletos come and be any closer than literally being in you? That's what he's saying. Spirit is going to be in you. Here's this other section that I was talking about before. He goes, uh, goes, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him but it, doesn't, it, but it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains in you and will be with you. So the first thing that you want to kind of, I want to just point out here, when it says you, we live in a Western individualistic world and we tend to read this as me, right? You, you will do greater works. I will? This is a y'all, y'all. This is not a you individual. This is a y'all collective that that he's talking about. There's a second person plural if you're an English nerd. 
And it's the church, if you're paying attention, right? It's talking about us all. The church is going to have the Holy Spirit. It's going to be with y'all, present tense, now, quality time. It's like to be present. You ever, you ever been in a room, but you weren't really in the room? Or you ever know somebody that was, they're, they're here, but they're not really here? They're not like present in the moment? That's this idea. The, the Holy Spirit is going to be present with you in every moment. And He's going to be present with you forever. Quantity and quality. And the second thing he says is that the world can't see this remarkable stuff on their own. They can't see the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the world can't see the Holy Spirit on their own, and, and so they're never going to connect with the Holy Spirit, and they're never going to see Jesus. That's where we come in. God's plan is that He would work in us and through us, because the world to, to the world, the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God's kingdom are invisible. And we make it visible as the Holy Spirit works in and through us. They can't see the Holy Spirit on their own. They don't know the Holy Spirit in their current standing. And they need the church to show up with the Spirit pointing to Jesus through their lives, through the way that they're reorienting their lives. Not just the way that they live life perfectly, but the way that they, the, the way that they handle when they don't. Sometimes the greatest witness that the church, that individual Christians can have, is when you mess up royally and then you ask for forgiveness. When they see your humility. When they see your vulnerability. Like, I'm not doing this perfectly and I'm sorry that I cut you off. I was a real jerk. I wasn't in the spirit in the moment. I was in my flesh trying to do better, right? They need to see real people trying to follow Jesus because they really believe in Him. That's what they need. Not perfect people, real people who passionately love Jesus and they want to follow Him. And when he's talking about the world here, by the way, if you're a glass half full type person, the world in this reference is not yet believers. The not yet believers cannot yet see the Holy Spirit, so therefore they cannot yet see the goodness of Jesus. They cannot yet fully grasp and understand and accept the gospel because they, they, don't, they don't have what you have. They don't have the Holy Spirit in you and Jesus in you. And so they need to see that in you. That's how they're going to see it. Does that make sense? And so when Jesus at the end, he's like, I'm going to go away and you're not going to be able to see, they're not going to be able to see me, but you will be able to see me because I live, you will live. And through your life living for Jesus, they're going to see me. Does that make sense? I know that's confusing, but that's, that's kind of what, what we're, we're unpacking here in this letter. And so I just want to end with a little summary and we'll have the, 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 the worship team come back up. To summarize what we have in this theological sandwich, all believers, you and I, all of us, are called to do Jesus' kingdom ministry until He comes back. What is God's plan for your life? Well, he, to, do, to do kingdom ministry. What does that look like? That that you need to have the Holy Spirit and you need to walk it out in real time. You need, to, you need to be in God's Word, sensing the Holy Spirit. Be around godly people that are helping like, oh, I see this in you. Or maybe here's this opportunity. Let's do this together. That is done in community. The nuances of what Jesus' kingdom ministry for you are, those are unpacked over a lifetime. But the fact that we all are called into ministry, that's just what Jesus is saying here. And then together with the Holy Spirit, he's saying we will collectively do more ministry than Jesus did during his 3.5 or 3 or however you calculate it, years of life on this earth before his death, resurrection, and ascension. And then the Holy Spirit does not replace Jesus. The Spirit energizes the church from within to passionately point 
to Jesus. The, the Spirit points us to Jesus so that we can point other people to Jesus. And then four, the Holy Spirit dwells in us and transforms us from the inside out, which is a primary way that people can see Jesus in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit comes to be at our side, helping us in all the ways we need in order to live godly lives. And so side note, the Holy Spirit comes and helps us live and do all that God has called us to do. And sometimes God is going to call us to do really big things. Sometimes God might call you to pray for somebody who needs to be healed and they will be healed. And sometimes God might call you to pray for someone who we think needs to be healed and the healing that God does is just the fact that you cared enough to pray for them. It was an emotional healing. Sometimes it doesn't look like the way that we, we expect. But sometimes God does big things in us and through us. But we also need to grasp more often than not, it's just us living ordinary lives with gospel intentionality and God using our passion to do that for His name and for His glory. And somehow God is making Himself known to us and through us in this process. And to me, that's a miracle. Amen? So if this week's big idea is the good news that if you want to follow Jesus, we have a helper that is capable of helping. The Holy Spirit abides with us, in us, and helps us. And next week we're going to get into chapter 15 where he's going to, he's going to shift that. He's going to build upon that and, and talk about the importance of us abiding in Christ. The Holy Spirit abides in us. And we need to abide in Christ. And so as we just prepare for worship, I want you to consider where you're at with a few statements. Would you say that you have seen the surpassing worth of following Jesus and in your heart you've, you've, you're convicted, you're committed, I will reorient my life. I will spend my life reorienting my life around that conviction. I want to make that the center point of my life, following Jesus. I want to be a passionate Jesus follower. And then are you confidently walking in the Spirit's help? Would you say that you're confidently walking in the Spirit's help? Or are you humbly walking in the Spirit's help? Because some of us, some of us, we have a fear of failure. And we don't want to try to follow Jesus because we don't want to fail. Are you confidently believing that the Holy Spirit is going to help you if you try? And some of us are just self-reliant. I'll just do it myself for Jesus. Are you willing to humble yourself and realize that will never work and begin to surrender your life over and say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, come take over the wheel. And it is such good news. Jesus is going to go to the Father and send the Spirit, and He has. And I can almost imagine Jesus coming and asking this morning, Remembrance Community Church, who's with me? And for those who would be like, I'm with you, I want to be with you. He's going to say, I'm with you too. And not only that, the Holy Spirit is with you. So let's go do this. That's the spirit of the farewell discourse. The ministry continues. The need for the Holy Spirit escalates. The potential to reach people for Jesus 
is greater and greater all the time. Jesus is not yet coming back. He's patient in coming back because he has more work to do. That's what Peter said. And that's, that's what we should be focused on. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, you are totally worth following, and there is no better plan for any of our lives than to follow you passionately. So please help us to see that. And please help us to reorient our lives around this conviction. Change us from the inside out. Help us live lives that glorify you, that display your good news everywhere we go. And we ask that you would point people to Jesus through each of our lives, through our successes and through our failures, through our collective lives as Remembrance Community Church and our individual lives day by day. Would you come and transform us this morning? Would you help us to surrender to the ministry of the Holy Spirit this morning, whatever you want to do? And if any of you would like to come forward and kneel on the carpet, no one will bother you. It's just a a space open to you to come do business with Jesus. You can do that right where you're at as well. If you'd like prayer, you can make your way to the back, and there's a team that would love to pray with you. But let's, let's, just, let's just sit in these thoughts and say, Jesus, help me want to follow you. Help me follow you. Amen.